Well, well, thanks for joining me, everyone. Welcome to the, the latest session from European Startups, a collaboration between Dealroom and Sifted, which is supported by the European Parliament and the European Commission. I'm Eina, an editor at Sifted, and you're joining me today at a time when the niche world of digital currencies appears to be tiptoeing closer to the mainstream via arts, via sport, via entertainment. So as one news report recently put it, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have gone from curiosity to punchline and now to viable investment. Well, at least for some people, at least. Uh, allowing all of this to happen, of course, is the blockchain, which true believers insist is transformative and ready to upend nothing less than the global financial system, the internet and economic incentives as we know them. So big ideas today to chew on. But luckily with me are three speakers who will no doubt help educate me on the future of a technology that, frankly, I have a hard time keeping pace with. So I have Jesse Baker. She is founder of Provenance, uh, a digital platform enabling producers, manufacturers, and retailers to track the journey of people, places, and ingredients behind their products. I have Petrus Silgalvis, he's head of the Digital Innovation and Blockchain Units at the European Commission. He's also co-chair of the Commission's FinTech Task Force. Uh, I also have Nicholas Brand, who is a partner at Lake Star, the venture capital firm where he invests and builds businesses using, among other things, uh, blockchain technology. So welcome to you all. And I'm gonna kick off with an open-ended question on this decentralized future term uh, that, that blockchain evangelists like to talk about. So Jesse, I'm going to come to you first and ask you, when you hear this term, what comes to mind for you and, and help me understand why this future might be a desirable one for all of us? So yeah, well, thing. Yes, I mean, I've been a long term believer that the next wave of kind of computing innovation will be driven by cryptocurrencies and blockchain tech. Um, I think we're in a bit of a trust crisis at the moment. We're seeing trust at an all time low with institutions, with businesses, and um, certainly with financial systems. So for me, I think a big part of this is kind of restoring trust and trying to create a whole new ecosystem of how trust is created across networks. Um, for me, kind of some of the key ideas are governance, I think is a really important idea in kind of the, the crypto space. I think the thing that excites me the most is that this is about enabling communities to make decisions together on how networks evolve and what's allowed and what's not allowed. And, and also, I think most importantly, how the economic benefits created through a network are distributed. So for me, it's um, a really exciting vision for a future of the internet that allows a kind of fairer tech ecosystem. Um, one that's kind of in the hands of the many, empowering the many, rather than at the moment, it's a bit of a walled, massive walled gardens um, policed by a few giants. So it's, for me, it's about kind of moving away from that as a key, key idea. Thank you. And I'll turn to Nicholas now. And of course, Nicholas, your day job is to make bets on the future. So how much are you buying into this uh, decentralized internet future it's such a loaded and powerful question and are you leading us into the debate with with a heavy with a heavy one to answer i think ultimately it boils down to having to understand a little bit the history of the internet and how the internet came about how it's been designed and who benefits from it and i think in the most abstract way the internet is very very good at routing data packs routing information the fact that we're having a video call from disparate locations right now is testament to that. The internet is not very good at storing information. It cannot do that. And hence, when you show up to something, usually in order to find out who it is, you have to authenticate yourself with a password or login, or there's hacks around it by placing cookies on your machine. And in essence, what happens is a database is being hooked up with the internet, and that's where the information, the valuable information is being stored. And that's how it has worked for a long time. And that's led to a system where you have a lot of silos of information all around the internet that are connected to each other. And those silos are owned not by those using it, but owned by centralized entities, right? So Facebook and Google are examples of that. 
And there's a practical implication that's probably illustrated by a very simple example. If you move house, for example, you have to update your address in 30, 30 or more different locations with your insurance, with your council and whatnot. And so that's onerous. Would be cooler if you owned that address yourself and hosted it yourself and you just update it there and everybody then tags onto it and it's automatically working through the system. But the, the perversity of the current internet system then led to the fact that those that sit on the information, those that have and administer the databases connected to the internet, like Facebook, they can extract value from it. They can extract value from knowing a lot about you and showing you a lot of advertising. And that is a challenge. And these large platforms now have become very powerful, omnipower. Mm -hmm. And this is what decentralization is about, is taking, unwinding some of that through technical capability that wasn't there 10, 20 years ago. And this is at the heart of the decentralization debate to me. It's the, what is a more equitable, a more fairer distribution of who owns what and who gets to profit from it? Okay. Well, thank you for that. Petrus, would you like to react to anything you've heard? And I'd also just put an additional argument to you that, you know, if, if blockchain does as well as people think and hope it will, does that mean we'll need less uh, of the European Union maybe in the future? Um, I think very wise things have just been said by the first two speakers, and I'll try to complement that. And then I'll actually answer to your last question with the first thing I was already going to say. Um, some years back in a panel that I was in, a uh, American panelist, I unfortunately don't remember the name, um, but said, he said, uh, blockchain is the ideal technology for the European Union because it is multi-level and it enables multi-level distributed governance, which I agreed with at that time and I've agreed ever, ever since. And because it was someone from a, across the pond that said it, I think it perhaps gives it a, a little bit of perspective from, from elsewhere. And the second additional comment I would make is that I think it's not decentralized or centralized, though you probably have something that is at one extreme or another, but decentralization is a spectrum. So you have applications like Bitcoin, uh, some of the other cryptocurrencies, um, some of the uses on the public blockchain of, of Ethereum. But for instance, with the European Blockchain Partnership and the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, this is reflecting the European Union's distributed governance. We have nodes or are about to have nodes in all 27 member states also at the European Commission, also at the uh, Court of Auditors, uh, Norway, Liechtenstein, probably going to the regional and municipal level. So not every person being able to operate a node, citizens will have access as users, but thousands, maybe even 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 uh, entities in the end, if it succeeds, uh, uh, it's still at an early deployment stage. Um, so it'll be quite decentralized for a cross-border um, government nations uh, a collaborative initiative at the level of the European uh, Union. And then the last comment, just a very short one, I think what Nicholas was saying is something that links very closely to self-sovereign identity, which is something we're also trying to promote both with the European self-sovereign identity framework, which is one of the use cases on the on the EPSI, on the blockchain infrastructure, as well as the new proposed regulation on EU EID. Okay. I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that in in a bit, but if we just step back a little bit, and if, if I ask all of you to just help me separate some of the hype from the reality when it comes to blockchain, I'd just like to get a sense of how far we've come. And I'd like to ask you, you know, to present interesting blockchain use cases that you've seen and ones that you can think of, but are still quite far off in the future, perhaps. So Jesse, maybe I'll return to you again. Yeah, sure thing. Um, I think it's good to talk practically about blockchains because if you get too much into the theory and the vision of it all, it's um, you quite quickly realize it's pretty pretty difficult to achieve. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess a bit of background on us and provenance before I go into some other interesting yeah. applications I see in the space. Um, so yeah, I mean, started tinkering around with, the, um, with blockchain tech back in 2014. 
provenance is one of the first applications on Ethereum. Um, so we kind of noticed the idea that potentially we could tokenize physical assets, and track them peer to peer. Seems like a great idea in theory. Um, and I think this kind of comes back to um, kind of the previous point, which is um, not all blockchains are equal. And provenance has very much started with a social mission. We want to help prove the impact of products and help catalyze a future where the impact of products is just as important, uh, you know, to why you decide to, to, to buy it as the brand it might have or the utility. So, yeah, we had this um, kind of interesting, like, practical challenge, which was, okay, we've got a mechanism that could create trust across a network, but uh, that network doesn't want to be fully transparent with its the, the volumes of, of, uh, of products that are moving through supply chains or necessarily... Um, you know, a lot, a lot of the other kind of criteria that we need to be brokering through the network. So I think what we're seeing in the blockchain space or have done over the past kind of um, sort of seven, eight years is real systems butting up against the kind of new model of a decentralized system. Um, and in Providence, we had to do kind of a bit of a major pivot away from tracking products peer to peer, which we realized it was it's such an unequal network as supply chain. Like a, a fisherman in Indonesia has no way got the same power as a supermarket, you know, here in the UK. So actually using that as a, as a test network for something like blockchain tech is mildly insane, actually, in hindsight. Um, there's some interesting efficiencies to be gained with more centralized blockchain ideas. So permission ledgers and consortium chains, uh, potentially creating some efficiencies in product recall. But when it comes to actually proving the impact of products, um, I'd say that that's that those kinds of applications have got quite limited um, potential. So in Providence, we actually focused our attention on tokenizing uh, the actual resulting impact of the product. So we created a, a, um, mm. a feature in our software called proof points. The whole point of a proof point is it's it's like a, it's the tokenized proof of impact of the product, be that a certification or, uh, a, you know, something like it's carbon neutrality. Um, so it's kind of like an impact Lego, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, and actually, this is this has been much easier application for us, us to run um, on a on a blockchain in a fully kind of decentralized manner. Um, it, it's natively transparent already. Like if you're saying your product is carbon neutral, that's something that's obviously transparent. It's on the label. Um, so us being able to take that and digitize it on a blockchain was was much easier. But it's also unlocking some interesting future applications for us, like that impact can also become a financial asset. Like we could use it to drive loyalty or give, you know, reward tokens and things like that, which is, um, yeah, a far easier application to catalyze a network for um, because you've got slightly more kind of homogenous uh, actors in the network, which makes catalyzing the network much easier versus tracking something through a full supply chain where there's uh, kind of a, a, a lot more complexities. So yeah, I guess that just paints a little bit of the practicality of kind of the pivot we've done as a as a blockchain based um, organization but I'm, I'm seeing loads of exciting applications in in the market I mean I think everything is going to be tokenized basically <laughs> I'm, I'm a real diehard believer in the tokenization of every single thing we're seeing exploding you know exploding in sport and collectibles and art and you know even Damien Hurst I think has now got a an NFT which is awesome um, and I think that that explosion is really unlocked for people like what this could really do like if you actually can link things to finance like in a seamless way like i mean just the the, the the potential of that's absolutely enormous i'm still mostly focused on impact and sustainability focused kind of ideas in this space so tokenizing you know uh carbon sinks like forests and things like that i find incredibly interesting and i think we're just scratching the surface of, of that right now um but for me that's the the next important frontier but I'll let others jump in. I know Nicholas has got loads of awesome um, examples in his portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. Nicholas, there's a new economy is being unlocked uh, in front of our eyes now, you know, surrounding these uh, NFTs, these this crypto digital art and tokenized assets. And frankly, some of it's a bit bewildering, but I'd love to hear uh, you guide us through it. This is one of the areas we're most excited by, actually. It's the... It's the intersection of blockchain and virtual worlds and anything that is natively digital in the first place. So you're not trying to mirror a physical object or a physical being onto something electronic, but it's, it's virtual in the first place. And ultimately, 
if anything, the pandemic has clearly shown that people hang out a lot more in virtual environments, in virtual spaces. And so that's been a tailwind to that phenomenon. And now what's interesting, if you need to under also weave into observations around cultural and demographic changes. So we spend time internally in regular intervals, like really looking at the different behaviors of different age groups. And if you, for example, talk to Gen Z, around, hey, when are you offline? When are you online? They don't get the question, right? They don't make that distinction. Mm -hmm. There's only life and a part of it is curated and spent online in, in different environments and, and part of it is, is happening physically. And the same laws and behaviors that we exhibit when we walk around the street by wearing certain clothes or certain jewelry or handbags or just how we curate ourselves physically, the same laws and behavior, they, they happen online also, right? We people take great care of their digital representation. LinkedIn is one version of it. When you show up in a video game, it's another version of it. And so the same desires and behaviors of wanting to dress in a certain way or wanting to equip your digital representation in a certain way, those same laws from the real physical world apply there too. And this is where the blockchain then comes in is you can really think through some powerful stuff around. We've invested into a company called Aglet. They do virtual sneakers virtual sneakers yes so your digital avatars can wear certain virtual clothing and the powerful aspect that blockchain brings in those sneakers can be ported from one outfit from one outlet digital platform to another one linking back to the decentralization comment made at the very beginning that's powerful those sneakers can be proven to really be truly yours despite them being digital that's blockchain too and that's powerful and so some of that stuff clearly is mind-bending but maybe it's only mind bending to us because we're not as well versed in it. The generation coming after us, two generations coming after us, to them, the NFT, a non-fungible token, that language, the behavior of that will be as just spinning up a Zoom call. Uh, it, it'll be naturally embedded to what's going on around them and it'll be very natural for them to interact in that way. And it's, it's mind bending and fascinating, but we're excited by it. Brilliant. It certainly is mind-bending. I wonder, with the NFT craze, I mean, where, where is that going to go exactly? Um, and I wonder just how accessible is, is it to everyone? Maybe not, yes. It seems that there is barriers to adoption across the board when it comes to blockchain. And certainly there seems to be very rich art collectors who are getting involved in NFTs. And maybe it's not quite as democratic the access to blockchain as it as it could be yes i don't know if you have any thoughts on that i think an nft is a means to an end it's not a thing in itself i think values of nfts are going to continue to plummet in many cases we have looked at uh, countless numbers of of ways of bringing it about and and too often i couldn't shake the feeling but an nft is a hot potato that somebody is going to end up holding and not being able to do anything with it afterwards. I think ultimately NFT first and foremost is a way of of bringing technological function about and, and, and creating digital scarcity. And it'll be table stakes in many virtual environments going forward. And there's only going to be a small fraction of NFT creators like popular artists, rock stars, Damien Hurst, like profiles that can actually monetize them on the back of it. The rest is just going to be technology that abstracts away in the background that is powerful but people won't even recognize they're using it mm -hmm. yeah i kind of agree i think with it there's such a thing at the moment but i, I agree they kind of blend i mean they're already like blending into the background of like certain computer games and stuff like you don't really you just think you're collecting stuff in the computer game like you don't really think about it being an nft particularly so i think it depends how they're being i think the art market really shines a light on it being a thing like it it's a new idea but like gamers i think have kind of used to this idea for a, a long time um like mount gox you know yeah. out of magic the gathering when was that 2013 or something um so yeah i think that the concept has been around for a very long time for for gamers particularly but yeah i think it's i, I don't know I, I in some ways think we've got to think about this beyond just the digital world um I don't know, the most important imperatives that we need to work on right now is how we protect our natural world. So if we constantly just think about them as things that are traded and exploited in 
virtual spaces, I think we're missing a massive trick. Um, and so it's difficult and connecting digital and physical is still like <laughs> not on impossible. Um, but I think we have to think about tokens and what they can do to econo economically incentivize preservation of our natural ecological systems and foster, you know, human interaction that's not just digital. Yeah, definitely. We'll come back to the issue around tokens. I'm going to just uh, go over to Petrus now and just ask him if he has seen any blockchain applications that he really likes so far and what does he hope will happen in this space in, in the next couple of years? Well, I, mean, I, have to, I have to be a little bit hesitant as coming from the European Commission and the public service to signal out any specific uh, commercial ventures. I think there's a lot of exciting things going on out there. The supply chain was just mentioned. I think self-sovereign identity initiatives, a lot going on with uh, decentralized approaches to sharing data, to tackling the challenges of, of climate change. So, I mean, I'll say a few words about the public sector initiatives where we think it's also going to provide a lot of efficiency and a way for citizens to get better access to public services and also to be more involved themselves. And so, for instance, in the European blockchain services infrastructure, we have the use cases on the self-sovereign identity, uh, the publishing of audit documents, which is for transparency, um, access to finance for SMEs, also uh, diplomas if you're going to study or work in, a, in another country that you can easily show uh, via a blockchain application your diploma diplomas also as you get continuing uh, uh, qualifications also some reg tech applications which will save 30 to 80 percent of the spending that we have on ICT and speed up uh, much faster um, regulatory reporting by member states, so again, easing things and not allowing regulators and supervisors more to be on top of what's going on. And then I can say good words for our colleagues at the European uh, Investment Bank, who issued a, a bond on the blockchain. And apparently this was both faster and less expensive than doing it in the conventional way. So again, this is something that's good for the taxpayer and also the, the public service should be innovating as well. I like your diploma example. It, it is a real pain to to contact your university and track down some of your results. I, I, I know, I know myself as well. And I have, <laughs> have sons who are at this stage of life as well. So, so yeah. So this, this uh, this big investment you're doing in infrastructure, this this is quite exciting. And it's going to be a mix of public and private blockchain, I guess. Um, well, it's a public initiative. The European Blockchain Partnership uh, Declaration, which is a ministerial declaration signed by all the ministers of, of the EU, Norway and Liechtenstein, and had been signed by the UK, because, but they left because they left everything. Um, uh, it uh, foresees also a public-private partnership Right now, what we're doing by innovation procurement, by public procurement, is buying. I mean, we're not doing, and it's certainly not me, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. Um, we're not uh, programming and building our own blockchains. We're utilizing existing ones and existing offers of uh, European entrepreneurs and, and companies. So buying it by public procurement and probably will be going into some tens of millions of public procurement in the digital Europe program. And then, as I said in the declaration, it's foreseen to do public-private partnerships. We don't have a serious one that has been proposed to the member states and the commission yet. There's been tentative discussions with ver on various ideas. But I mean, this is something that we hope to see it evolving in that direction as well. Some sensitive things like tax reporting will stay public, public and, and controlled and uh, with the requisite cybersecurity. But some other things like the, the diplomas could move into all kinds of, I think, continuing education and with with providers of such uh, of such services. Great. And of course, we see a lot of different uh, blockchains in use now, whether it's Ethereum or Bitcoin SV. I mean, would it be desirable in the future if people start congregating around one or, or just a, a handful? Would, would that be useful if the fields narrowed a little bit in the, in the future? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I, I agree. I think that's one of the things holding back innovation now is the lack of interoperability um, between chains. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's some, some great projects going on to try and connect different blockchains together. Um, quite a fan of Postdoc and what they're doing, um, making a slightly more kind of unified, connected infrastructure um, with, with Ethereum. Um, I mean, I think that's a lot of the barrier right now, like as a st practically as a startup or as a business, like looking to get into this space, it's quite overwhelming. There's loads yeah. of different blockchains. They've got tons of different governance structures and lots of those governance structures are still actually quite centralized. So it's still a small group that are deciding what goes on with this chain. And so as much as it's a lot better than, I mean, I don't know, I developed an application on Instagram that instantly the API changed and it just was a complete waste of time and you know, of money. So that's worse for sure. <laughs> but you know, it's still it's still not the, the kind of governance structures of a lot of these blockchains are still being developed and are a bit immature. Um, yeah, I, I think there has to be more standardization as well. I mean, the ERC20 token is such a great success. And I think that really ignited to so many people like what this could be and how interoperable um, the future of this could be. But that was just the beginning. We absolutely have to set more standards and get more agreement across the board of how these chains are going to interact and how we'll represent different levels of security across different chains. Um, but yeah, that's just, just starting, I think. Well, I've got a, got a distinct view on that too, I think. But I, bear with me for 30 seconds because I need to explain something that is so crucial in understanding decentralization. That's pointing a finger at where blockchain is currently causing the most amount of havoc. And that's actually around the question, what is money, right? What is money? I think we're 10 years into the blockchain cycle, but if you take really a longer term view and you recognize that most of our societies operate with a central bank, commercial bank, financial system, and that has been mentally conceived that system over a hundred years ago. And so you should expect that there is going to be change, right? Over a hundred year period. And blockchain has kind of kickstarted that change to happen. And there's now intense competition over forms of money between governments, right, US, Europe, China, but also between public and private sector, is PayPal, Visa, are they forms of money? Are the networks they build, are they forms of money, question mark? And then there's, of course, Bitcoin and others that are challenging central bank monies in their status and their functionality, keeping central bankers at the edge of their seat. And so that's a fascinating mm -hmm. one to see unfold. And, and Peter, I know it's it's a beast to regulate and, and understand how to regulate. And so in answering the question, what is going to be, is there going to be a winning protocol or not? I think ultimately our internal view is that people will want to hold value in the most valuable and most secure protocol. And that means in the most sound money, hence that prelude. And so might be and is likely going to be a combination of Bitcoin, if you ask me, and a form of central bank money that is going to leverage blockchain technology. But then people in a, in a world where interoperability, as you said, Jesse, where you, you can smoothly transition from one blockchain into another, when it comes to functionality, people will branch out into all kinds of different protocols to consume Ethereum for the virtual machine or Infinity or other use cases on the gaming side and others. And, but when it comes to holding value, they will always want to settle back to the most sound, to the most secure protocol. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I, I think one thing just to add on that, which I think relates to the interoperability point, is just I don't think people are talking enough about how amazing smart contracts are. And particularly if you think about European Commission, right? And, and kind of where there's so many systems that need to connect and interoperate, like, I, I, I don't know, I, I think smart contracts are like the best invention ever. Like it's so like so cool, but and but they're only gonna be truly realized as this kind of incredible if this then that machine if we really do have that interoperability between the chains, because otherwise they're just doing interesting things on one blockchain. But if we get that interoperability, then you know, imagine you could get like a loan in like one second, you know, like stuff like that, which is just amazing. Like that will just open up so many opportunities. 
Well, if I, if I can break in on this right now, we have our uh, public consultation on the Data Act open right now. And a chapter is on smart contracts, what people see as both the barriers and the potential of smart contracts, uh, which is something that we want to enable ever more and ensure that there's no fragmentation of requirements for for smart contracts across the EU so that they can flow seamlessly at least across the, the 27 member states in the European economic area. So please uh, respond positively okay. or in yeah. another way on that if uh, if that's something that you're interested in because obviously uh, we have interest. Yeah, absolutely. I think it could be revolutionary for kind of governmental organizations in terms of, kind of what, what it could unlock and the efficiencies it can enable. So yeah, we'll check that out. Awesome. I'll fill it out, Peter. I think the last public consultation I filled out was the one from the Central Bank on the digital euro. These are some proper hard-earned questions. It took me two and a half hours to fill everything in properly. These were really good questions that were posed. <laughs> and yet yesterday we had the announcement. We're moving into the experimental phase of the European Central Bank, and then we're from the Commission on the, on the other side of that cooperation. Well, I was going to ask you, Petrus, actually, just how long can... The European Commission or and policymakers in general just sit back and watch the developments of blockchain and the, the crypto world. I mean, the EU has already decided it's going to get in there. It's going to legislate for artificial intelligence. When do you think? At what point does it make sense to bring regulation to bear in in this world, blockchain world? Well, we we have. Uh, we're we're technology neutral, so we don't have a regulation on servers, on transistors. AI is kind of an exception if you consider it a, a technology as such and not as a, a whole area of technological development. Um, but so we have uh, markets and crypto assets. The digital assets are, are covered by this proposed regulation right now. That's mm -hmm. accompanied by Pilot, which is a regulatory sandbox for market infrastructures using uh, distributed ledger technologies that can be freed of the requirement to have a centralized securities depository. Both of these are in negotiation in the Parliament and the Council right now. Uh, you can see a lot, I mean, the texts and uh, a lot of the developments online. The new EID proposal has uh, articles on electronic registers and electronic uh, ledgers, basically giving recognition for self-sovereign identity or trust services of the decentralized possibilities, um, also to have a, a legal outcome to show some kind of certificate or certification. And then finally, the Data Act, which is about data, but part of the way that we think that data can be shared and managed is through smart contracts. So those would be addressed in, in the Data Act. And then you have things like anti-money laundering, which has already been adopted. And then there's a necessity when you go in and out of fiat currency to uh, declare this um, from uh, crypto earnings or, or losses as well. And from the private private perspective, Peter, is what I find powerful about the markets and crypto assets regime proposal, Mika proposal is blockchain and cryptocurrencies are getting their own asset class. They're not being pushed into e-money or securities necessarily, they, if they are, sure, but they, they get, they're get being recognized for what they are, an entirely new asset class in its own right. And what's so remarkable about that is actually the fact that the European Commission and what you're doing, you're moving more quickly, faster than a lot of the venture investors in Europe. The regulator is supposed to be the one to be slow and, and regulate things afterwards, but with that proposal, you're moving faster than some of the investing community. Yeah, and I heard, you. <laughs> <laughs> I heard an example of some legislation recently in Germany that potentially could enable some, some uh, innovation around blockchain. This law on, on, um, on supply chains and putting a requirement on German companies to you know, have a full view of their supply chain and it speaks to blockchain, it's, it sounds like. I wonder if Jesse has heard about it. Son. Yeah, no, I have. Um, really amazing. It's so great to see countries like Germany coming out at the fore with this kind of regulation. So it's really exciting. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's calling for standardization and how this information is reported. It's, it's calling for credibility. So to be able to back up that information with evidence and, um, you know, a certain degree of, of proof. 
So yeah, I, I really think it is. I think what's very tricky is, yeah, I, I, again, I guess it's, it's talking about the similar challenges we faced at Provenance. Like, sure, maybe one day every supply chain will be fully connected end to end in a decentralized fashion to track every single asset end to end. The reality is supply chains are not uh, new, uh, not digitally native networks, really. Like they're kind of almost the furthest away from that of all the things. Like mm. it's, it's unlike, you know, a bunch of gamers all on who are already on Twitch. They're already all connected. There's no, you know, there's no issue like introducing an NFT into that system. The supply chain is for the most part like digitized in a format that kind of looks like 1980s, like teletext very little interoperability sometimes it's amazing that the data is not even stored in the cloud so it's it's really depends on kind of what type of supply chain you're looking at as to how close it is to being able to transition to that kind of ideal supply chain blockchain future however i think some of the verification that they're after in terms of the transparency they're looking to to gain could benefit from blockchain tech and certainly um yeah certainly the data going in and what it's matched with on the other side to create some kind of verification um yeah i mean we're very much looking at it at provenance because yeah it, absolutely pr provable impact transparency is is a, the kind of whole crux of, of what we're doing so yeah we're looking to help businesses be compliant to that yeah i spoke to, i spoke to a founder this week and his big idea was was a blockchain for the fashion supply chain and mm -hmm. he's he softened his ambitions now he, he said much the same thing he said it's too ambitious it's not going to happen yet um you know, it's, it's very it's, hard to deal with the real world. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the virtual world is so much easier, you know, like buying fake land in Decentraland or, you know, buying a NBA top shot is just so much easier, right? Like when that when that thing really links to a physical asset that's got its own life, it's, yeah, much harder. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes, sometimes it's said that uh, blockchain is a team sport. And I mean, that's the yeah. hard part getting a blockchain up and running and connecting some nodes is relatively simple. If you're bringing people together who are competitors or different, uh, different types of uh, enterprises in a supply chain and so on, it's coordinating them, it's dealing with the legal relationships, also the, the attitudes towards sharing certain kinds of information. That's what takes the time, like, like in the real world. Totally. Yep. Yeah, I, sh I should also say, actually, I'm just looking at the time. I should just remind the audience to, to get in touch and leave a comment or leave a question in the chat box and I'll have a look at it when I can. That'd be great to hear from you. Um, just going back to this issue of tokens, I wonder if anyone wants to just speculate as to how far this, this uh, idea could go. I mean, could we ever tokenize ourselves and sell access to, I don't know, health companies for our for our health data how, how far can this idea of tokenizing things go go jesse you've already said we can tokenize everything i wonder i mean i think so i think all digital physical assets can be tokenized in some way shape or form um absolutely I think selling your data i mean i think that's that would be far more optimal right than it just having it taken without your permission which most of the big social networks are doing now, oh sorry, I did I did give my permission, but you know it wasn't a, it was a trade, it wasn't the fairest trade. So yeah, I, I absolutely think um, all kinds of uh, digital business assets will be tokenized. Um, yeah, I think just and the affordances that that will give us, like the access to like liquidity, plugging into DeFi, I find really exciting. Like making all of these things tradable in um, I, yeah, I think it'll be really really interesting. Um, I think it's it's a tricky one though. We've got to kind of be careful because it's all these things are very different. And like as a provenance, we've been token. We're looking at tokenizing impact, like the impact a product has, and it's very complex. Like the, the types of data we're looking at, it's you know, it's carbon, it's impact on biodiversity, it's workers. So like distilling that down to something that's a tokenized asset that can be traded and shared is it's quite a, yeah. It, I think setting the rules around the tokenization is is really complex idea yeah. it connects to things like personal data and things that are not fungible um i think it's yeah quite quite complex um but yeah i mean we've got to start to build the building blocks and create the legos 
that could be tokenized and traded and have sandboxes where we're doing experiments and we talk about the ethics of this, I think is really vital. But I'm excited about it and certainly more excited about that version of the future than kind of, I guess, how things like our personal data is handled right now. I think I've got I've got a fairly progressive view on that too, and that that rhymes with your view. I think Jesse is around. Every asset will be tokenized eventually. Every smart contract or every contract is likely going to be a smart contract, hence leverage blockchain capability. And every identity too will be blockchain based. That includes our identities, us as individuals, citizens. And it's important to recognize though that tokenization doesn't necessarily mean decentralization. There's a lot of misunderstanding about that i think ultimately in in particular in the world of finance defi decentralized finance often is being perceived to refer to the future and cfi centralized finance our traditional financial system is being referred to as the past the way it's been done before and i think it's not an either or decision it's not an either or endpoint we'll have a combination of a lot of things going forward decentralized networks connecting with centralized networks, just like the internet. The internet is a network of networks, a mesh network, really, when you think about it. The same will happen in, in finance, and the same will happen with tokenized assets interacting with each other. And so tokenization doesn't automatically mean decentralization. It just means leveraging the efficiency that a token can bring about in handling assets. Our financial system today is in part still very, very expensive because there's a legacy system over a legacy system. And so you can design that more efficiently. And um, and leveraging that will is, is the trigger, the crucial trigger for everything to be tokenized in the first place. I wonder, Nicholas, how many how many blockchain ideas are you seeing in a, in a typical week now? How many people are coming to you with with wacky or interesting or fun ideas? It ebbs and flows. I think it's just like the, the, the prices are representative or an indicator for the degree of hype out there. I think 2718 was an intense period. We were just coming off an intense period last six months. And we had that perversity in the system a few years ago where like founding teams describing that I'll oh, take anything and I put it on the blockchain it becomes better as a result. That is not the case. That is not necessarily the case. Often putting something on the blockchain makes it more inefficient in the first place, but it can bring about more powerful functionality on the back of it. And so there's trade-offs involved and people are only beginning to understand some of the intricacies. We're only 10 years in, mind you. I think this is incredible. We're only 10 years in and already today so much more powerful things have been achieved. I think what we're paying attention to, Ina, is around, if you if you look at, take some of the bulge bracket tech firms from the Silicon Valley. So you've got very talented engineers leaving an Apple, leaving an Amazon, leaving a Facebook. Where do they go? And if you track that, we've, we've attempted to systematically track that. But, We've gotten some interesting data. They tend to go into two areas right now, AI-related things and blockchain. Yeah, sure. And so the intellectual capacity, the desire to bring about change and experiment in decentralization today, independent of the hype cycles, has never been higher if you measure it in outstanding development skill. I heard you tell an interesting story. You had a run in with a guy wearing a Hawaiian shirt and hiking boots. He was one of the, the earliest people to come to you for, with a blockchain idea. He did raise some funding eventually and disappeared with the funding together. And so um, yeah, left some investors unhappy. And so it wasn't us. <laughs> so Jesse, you, you've been, you've been um, around blockchain from the very beginning. One of the first yeah. people probably to to start a company based on, on this technology, this idea. I mean, is it still, is it getting easier to explain it to people? I, I heard a founder this week say, there's just, there's so much nonsense around crypto and, and so much attention to the volatility of the price and, and Dogecoin and Elon Musk tweeting. <laughs> that it's, it's still very hard for consumers to wrap their heads around it. Has it gotten worse recently? Uh, no, I, I, I... I think the whole space has developed. Uh, 
I think slower than I, I thought. I had a good healthy dose of naivety back in sort of 2013 when just started discovering and experimenting with this technology. But I think, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think I've kind of learned that this is a multi, this is a multi-decade um, uh, kind of step change shift that's happening. Um, has it got easier? Uh, yeah, I think so. Like people are a lot more aware of the technology, but it's just such a shame that people focus on the price and what does Elon think um, when actually this could be the future of the internet. This is a really exciting way to re-decentralize the internet and empower so many people with and give them agency in our digital world, which is billions of people all interacting and just, I don't know, I just think there's such huge power in that and I don't think people quite realize like what it could unlock. So yeah, I, I don't know. Lots more people know about it. Lots of people are interested in it. I think NFTs are doing great stuff because people feel like they can be part of it and they can buy one and that's not very complicated. And it's like, oh, okay, this, you know, this is a system I can be part of. Um, but I guess what I'm passionate about is I saw an opportunity with blockchain tech to kind of recap, re kind of recalibrate kind of capitalism in a way. Like we've, we've destroyed the planet with this form of capitalism. Uh, we need like in crazy big step change innovation in order to align us as a humanity to tackle the problems we have ahead of us. And I don't know, this is an incentive system like no other. So I kind of just wish there were more people that could see it like that, particularly like software designers, not just developers. Like I think everyone thinks it's like you have to be a tech developer. I think uh, one of the huge barriers at the moment with, with blockchain tech is it's got a user experience problem. And it's very difficult for people to interface with it and understand how they can uh, connect with it. So, yeah, I, I think it would just be great to see more people from more works of life seeing if this is as a potential new step change for the internet and what that could unlock. Yeah, and if I if I go to Petrus, uh, I'd love to hear what, what you're seeing in Brussels because, of course, the European Union also has funding pots, has the European Innovation Council, has the Digital Europe Programme. Are you seeing lots of uh, blockchain projects coming your way or coming yeah, towards? Quite, 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 quite a few. Um, we're not a research unit where, where I work. We're a, a deployment policy and legislation unit. So our research portfolio is, is very small and aimed more at startup networking, Startup Europe. You might know that program. But through the, um, through the Next Generation Internet program, there is a lot of funding of decentralized technologies, SSID, blockchain. We collaborate very closely with those colleagues and work with them on the calls that they do in the, in the research context. And as I mentioned, we had this uh, pre-commercial procurement and innovation procurement basically to build uh, the uh, European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, which is a deployment project, it's not research. And we'll have a number of calls to, to build it out uh, next year. And we're also building a regulatory sandbox at the European Union level mm -hmm. where uh, innovators who want to collaborate with uh, three or more member state regulators across borders to do live testing with blockchain applications will be able to apply and get the support of the sandbox mechanism to do that. There'll also be a fintech sandbox, which is associated, but which will be run by our DG FISMA, our financial services colleagues. And then ours will be blockchain as such in all the other sectors. So these are some of the things out there and there'll be more research money. Usually the research money isn't build something on blockchain, but it's there's this kind of challenge and it may have a decentralization element what can you, the research community, do to address that? And so you get a lot of blockchain projects in this type of context. Okay, thank you very much. And Jesse, if I can just return to the point you made uh, a few minutes ago about destroying the planet. I know you're very, um, you've written about the huge flaw of public blockchains, um, their extreme energy hogs. Yes. Um, yeah, how do we get greener blockchains? Because this seems to be becoming a real problem. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's it's a tricky one because as much as I'm passionate about the potential benefits to society and the planet of what this technology can do, we have to like look at the reality of today and how crazily energy guzzling these public chains are. I mean, 
that Bitcoin is more energy guzzling than the entire US federal government, which is pretty insane considering what they're actually doing at the moment. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's certainly a huge issue, but I think there is, there's a silver lining to the cloud. Um, I mean, we're, we're seeing transitions to proof of stake. So the Ethereum community is really finally making some headway there, which has been talked about for a long time. But um, it's really exciting to see them slowly transitioning to proof of stake. And I think, you know, over $9 billion has been staked in order to help manage that transition. So I think it's a little bit behind, but tail end of this year, going into next year, I think we should see a really tangible move, which will, uh, of course, massively lower the energy consumption of the network, which will unlock a whole new frontier, I think, for Ethereum, which is which is really exciting. Um, and there are similar activities going on with other public chains. There are, of course, blockchains that have been created that are already natively proof of stake or are using other consensus mechanisms that are much lower energy. And I think those are gaining traction. But as I mentioned before, we've got this kind of interoperability problem, people wanting to stick with a you know, if you're building on a public chain, you what you want probably want to stick with one of the kind of more popular chains right now until that interoperability issue is is resolved. But that's that's slowly coming down the path. And then, yeah, I mean, I think there is also a bit of a silver lining in you know, there's lots of writing. I think Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey are kind of constantly talking on Twitter about um, you know whether actually crypto is a catalyst for more development of renewable energy um, because it can you know. You know, it, it, the classic thing with renewable energy is, of course, the sort of peaks of troughs and demand, and uh, you know, when's it sunny, when's it windy, um, and actually, can crypto be a kind of uh, almost like a battery or, or a way for earning earning money from renewables in, in kind of off times? And I think there's some really interesting plans that have been put out there. There's a massive uh, wind farm in Texas that I know is also connected to a Bitcoin mine um, that's been mm. quite effective at showing kind of how you can earn money at you know. If it's windy at 4 a.m. and no one wants power, like there's actually you know potential for you to earn money through the mine at those times. So yeah, definitely some silver linings there, um, and some some great work being done to to transition to a lower energy future of this technology. But it's just a shame because it kind of creates this argument of yeah, planet. It's it's it, I don't know. I, I just find it quite frustrating because I do think there's such amazing potential for good from this technology that at the moment is yeah overshadowed by the energy guzzling sadly but i'll, I'll uh, share around in the chat the article i wrote on this as well which outlines yeah it. yeah it's very good yeah on a, on a similar a similar question really or similar theme um just curious how how worried some of you are that's that's you know blockchain could end up recreating or repeating the same mistakes as, as some people see them of of the current economy or the current internet you know because what we're seeing right now, it's it's still quite a plutocratic system. You know, the more money you have in real life, the more cryptocurrency you can buy. And, you know, we, we were promised that blockchain could cut out the middlemen. But I think when you look at the NFTs, you, you see middlemen who are profiting off some of the trading that's going on in these digital assets. So I just wonder, will it be the utopia that some people hope it will be? impossible to answer in a succinct way you know except for appreciating for for what it is it's a technology first and foremost that different people use for different things and as you said at the very beginning as an investor you're in the, you're in the future business we're in the future business so it's about detecting patterns building up hypotheses around what could a future look like and then investing against it and so one thing that becomes Kind of apparent when you study these these patterns over time is that with any type of technology you tend to to go in these build and deploy cycles almost like a pendulum swinging and so with the internet as such late 80s early 90s was a build phase and you put desktop machines on people's desks and eventually they connected to the internet which led to that first generation of digital businesses during the 90s which then bust of course early to 2001 i think that led to this another build phase that brought about the smartphone. And then we exited that with the Airbnb, Facebook, Google of this world, all being very powerful businesses. And I think let's recognize that blockchain as a technology is just now, I think, leaving the build phase. We're just now in the first innings of this being delivered in a way for consumers that is comprehensible. It's easy enough to understand that the apps are accessible intellectually, Kind of followable 
and and delivered in a nicely designed way. So we're only now starting to see early deployments and we're at the very beginning of that. And of course, there's going to be, there will continue to be high, high friction around what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But over a 10 year period, I couldn't, I couldn't be more excited about it. And I think eventually, just like we'll have today, any one of us probably has a Wi-Fi router in our home, like a kettle. The Wi-Fi router is almost as given now as a kettle or an oven. We'll be running nodes on these routers at some point. And that'll be part of our home setup. And any it's abstracted in a way the background, we won't know exactly how it works, except for that it's there. And by the time that happens, blockchain has conquered the world. All right. Well, that's very positive. So I'm just checking the time, five minutes remaining. I think there's, round, there's time for one last round of questions. And I just want to ask you all, you know, if we were to return to this the same conversation in a few years' time. What what do you think will have been some of the most visible success stories of blockchain or the crypto worlds at large? So I'll first go to Petrus uh, for his thoughts. Well, I, I think there'll be definitely some uh, public service uh, successes, uh, quite uh, large scale deployment. I think there'll be a certain consolidation among the, the public blockchains. And this will be based on and this will enable greater consumer take up because they'll be easier to use applications that people don't have to know about blockchain to use blockchain, but it'll be more what's provided for for the citizen. I think we'll have the digital euro, hopefully. Uh, and uh, I think there'll be space for private innovation on how to use tokenization, smart contracts, central bank digital currencies, the different potentials of the blockchain for business to business, B to C, peer to peer. I mean, a whole ecosystem of uh, very exciting things. Great, thank you. I'll turn to Nicholas with the same question. Well, I accidentally answered it before for describing would uh, how widespread it might turn out to be by sitting in every one of our homes and we'll manage our family identities over it very naturally in a way that it's infrastructure in the background we don't have to consciously operate and so again it, it'll 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 be pervasive across finance it'll be pervasive in how citizens citizens interact with their governments i i agree with Petrus around the use cases there and Something, again, we're very passionate and I have to disclose, I've got a European passport, but we've got a, an advantage over here in Europe because the European Union as such, with all its complexities, is kind of decentralized designed in the first mm. place. Again, it comes with certain complexities and process intensities, but I think that provides optimal nourishing ground for embracing this type of technology. And that's, that's powerful. Agree with you what you said. I mean, such powerful answers. I think, I think there's very little doubt that this technology will help create efficiencies and uh, enable contracts to be, yeah, something that's that's a far more seamless experience, regardless of, of what it is. But I do think we're at a crossroads right now of as to how this technology will really operate. Like, will it really be a force for good? Like, will it be governed in an open, fair, inclusive way? Or, I don't know, will it be manipulated into something that actually just creates a internet as it is now with wall gardens, but now now money is attached to that, which is really scary. So I, I don't know. I, I think we've, the innovation, a lot of the innovation and, and kind of governance decisions are, are still ahead of us because hardly any of these networks are really operating it at the kind of scale that we we'd need them to be to do what they need to do. So... Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm very excited about the future of this, of this tech, but I do think we need to be having these kinds of discussions because the, the governance of this technology is not written in stone. So hopefully it will be a positive future. All right. Well, there we have it. Thank you so much. I think we're, we're bang on time, so I'm going to leave it there. But thank you so much for joining me today, and thanks to the audience for tuning in. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys.
Great. Thanks so much. I'm going to hop off. <laughs>